Hey guys and welcome to Comment Commentary. This is a part of the channel where I take a look at some of your more insightful comments and reflect on them. Uh, you guys have always been a blessing in that you've left incredibly insightful and intelligent comments and they've always given me something more to think about after I've put up a video. So this is again another good opportunity for me to catch up on some of those really good points and to share them with the wider audience of this channel. Okay, so without further ado, let's crack on with our first comment. The first comment left by Wildrick, who says, as so many, oh, and this was on the video for the Corora Project first impressions review. Uh, and Wildrick says, as so many others have commented, you should take a look at another desktop environment spin to get a proper review. KDE has been wonky and I've tried switching to it. Uh, OpenSUSE, KDE Neon, Kubuntu, Manjaro, several times, uh, allured by some neat features. I always end up coming back to Mate, Budgie, Shell Gnome 3 stack because of the out of nowhere errors I get on KDE based desktop environments. That said, I think that uh, Corora is to a degree a misdirection of resources that could be poured into the main distro. The same, I think, can be applied to Linux Mint to Ubuntu. Okay, so this is a comment, a few people have left very similar comments to this. Uh, when I did the Corora first impressions review, and it was really only glancing over it on, on a virtual machine, but I did try three different desktop environments. I tried GNOME, I tried KDE, and I tried Cinnamon. Uh, GNOME didn't boot at all. Now, I, I didn't necessarily try and, 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 and fix those errors head on or anything like that. It just didn't boot in a virtual machine, therefore ditched it, moved on to the next image. So it could very well have been an easy problem to solve there. Uh, the Cinnamon, I didn't like any more than the KDE uh, version. It just seemed to be like a GTK equivalent of it. Um, the theming, and I very rarely ever see Cinnamon themes actually look what I consider nice. The, a lot of Cinnamon themes actually put bold text in the taskbar. Bold text on the... Um, the window buttons, bold text on the menu items, bold text on the clock, and it, it just to me it just does not work. Bold sans serif text very rarely ever works and whenever it does it's in small doses when you're you know emphasizing a word or a part of a title or something like that. Um, so even just on, on the aesthetics um, I can't say I really quite uh, you know I can't say I really liked it. Um, Mate and XFCE I would have expected to have been the best desktop environments for the you know, out of the lot there. Uh, I'd say that about almost any other distribution as well. Um, XFCE and Mate, I've I've personally had the most success with when it comes to desktop environments. I don't know if it's because they're GTK based, because they're specifically designed to run on a wide, um, you know, a wide selection of um, Linux distributions or, or whatever. Uh, but that being said, the underlying stuff really wouldn't have differed from from Fedora other than the, the few additional third-party repositories that it puts in. So, and, and and of course you get the Fedora support behind that as well. That's again, that's quite important. Like the Corora project, it, it's not that big. It's tiny compared to Fedora. So you've got a lot more help when something goes wrong on a Fedora distribution than a F Fedora respin distribution of this kind as well. Uh, next comment comes from Sheriff Blatz. I personally believe uh, the Linux world needs more negative reviews, not less. Just because it's free and a community effort does not mean its flaws shouldn't be pointed out. Um, this is where I was coming from with the Corora project. Um, is I, you know, I, I really don't like putting out negative reviews. And I, I feel that this channel certainly is guilty of being one of those Linux distro cheerleading channels. I think there are a few reasons for that. The first is that I think that the Linux, dist, uh, Linux distributions in general and the Linux community is the healthiest that it's all ever been. It's the best that it's all ever been. We've got more uh, choice. We've got more selections. We've got literally thousands of games where... 10 years ago, that would have been unheard of. People would have laughed in my face if I said that there would be thousands of really good games that you can play on, on, on Linux. So if I am cheerleading, it's because I wouldn't have been 10 years ago. So, um, and, and, I, uh, and maybe this carries on with deeper through the Linux community as well. Maybe it's that many people who have been around the block even longer than I have, um, have seen Linux grow from something very modest to something very you know, like like an international powerhouse. And to see that journey uh, unfold over your lifetime is really quite uh, quite something that you you really have, you know, the, so it's really easy to even overlook the, the negative aspects of it. Not to say that they're not there, but, um, 
but absolutely, it is. It is. It is easy to be uh, a Linux cheerleader. Um, but I, I, I think you're right. Um, I, I do work on a number of voluntary projects myself, and I also know that it's incredibly easy for like other people to then critique that. Uh, even sometimes thinking that they're doing a good thing rather than just, uh, you know, um, just just sort of expressing their opinion for for personal validity. Um, and 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 uh, but there have you know, and there have been many volunteer projects that I've broken my back on. Um, only for people to sort of turn around and, and 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 you know sort of complain slash be very critical about it, you know um, when it was something that they could have always helped with, you know. So so it's it's very easy to criticise. I think that's the overall point that I'm making. Um, and so I don't want to so I don't want to be overly harsh um, because I kind of know what it's like to be on the on the other side there. Um, Gasekama says that Ubuntu Budgie will be official with 1704 and this was left on my uh, budgie remix first impressions review which i was very 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 impressed with although it was just budgie on an ubuntu base uh it, it worked it works really really well but yes um it actually i thought it was going to be uh, 1804 is going to be the next long-term support release it turns out that budgie must have impressed the official ubuntu community so much that they decided to make it official starting with 1704 fair play to them well deserved, I think. Well deserved. I th I have a feeling, judging from the distribution itself, it was always gearing towards that goal. Pidus Redla uh, says that vertical panel finally I'll be able to use Cinnamon. Yes, I got to say the it is nice that Cinnamon now have the vertical panels, uh, especially on. Um, laptops, I find that vertical panels are particularly useful just to have a panel down the left hand side of the screen. Saves you on the widescreen real estate, especially since a lot of websites and interfaces now are designed for like a multitude of, of resolutions um, and even a multitude of aspect ratios because of, um, of phones now. So you can actually be quite, you know, your desktop is probably more malleable than it was five, ten years ago uh, in terms of you can put panels on the on the side, whereas, you know, five, ten years ago, that would have probably thrown out the, the layout of a lot of websites and a lot of applications. But nowadays, because of resolutions being bigger, screens being bigger, screens being wider as well, like a lot of people feel that the screen real estate uh, left and right is... Um, there's more of it to spare than top and bottom. And, and that's certainly a very logical point. So... Um, so yeah, vertical panel. Way to go, Cinnamon. It was, it was, it was a, uh, it was, it was about time too. Oh, uh, not ordinary in games. Ask the question: Is the window four three because it's a virtual machine? This was left on my review of Fedora twenty five, but it's certainly applicable to other distributions. Uh, yes, if I review a distribution and you see that it's in a four three aspect ratio, that means the there are black bars on the left and right sides. Uh, that means that there that's how it came out in the virtual machine basically some um, distributions uh, have like built-in virtual box functionality that allows you to have a resolution that, that fits out your screen a bit nicer um, but some distributions like Fedora uh, and, and it's always been the case with Fedora if I remember correctly that when you load it up in a virtual machine it's pretty rigidly uh, 1024 by 768 resolution that's 43 um, I'm sure if I was to run Fedora in a mach uh, virtual machine for for any duration, I probably would have worked out uh, how to how to get other aspect ratios in. But because it's usually just first impressions videos that I do, uh, I don't usually bother. But Linux Mint and Ubuntu um, and uh, Manjaro, I think, and Turgos maybe, uh, they all have um, uh, ways of, uh, of of adjusting the resolution. Uh, Neo Scribe asks, is this beta? It's not up yet. Where did you get it? About my quick look at Linux Mint 18.1. Uh, yes, when I do try out Linux Mint distributions, I try out the, um, usually the release candidate, um, if I'm sort of looking for a distro to review around that time. And the reason I do that, and I, I tend to do it with Linux Mint more than other distributions, is because uh, because Linux Mint is just built as a layer on top of Ubuntu, their release candidates are really quite stable. They're stable enough that I don't, I, in fact, I don't even think I've ever had a bug, uh, or at least a sizable bug in, in a release candidate of, of, of Linux Mint. I could be wrong on that one. My memory could be failing me. But generally speaking, the release candidate of Linux Mint is really quite good. It's, it's really quite uh, quite reliable. So, um, Verithal, apologize if I mispronounced that, 
Guys, I have a very basic ultra portable laptop with an Intel A Atom Z8300 on board, clocked at 144 GHz and 2 MB of RAM. I'm going to assume that's gigabytes of RAM, but I don't know. Uh, I was wondering what would be the best distribution. I am looking for something lightweight, safe, although I guess all Linux distributions are safe. Well, some are safer than others. Um, something that I'd barely even notice. The problem is that this laptop doesn't handle Windows 10 very well, even though that's the system it came with. I'm new to Linux, had Ubuntu for a very short period of time running on a virtual machine. Uh, right now I'm forced to use this laptop. It doesn't even have enough enough horsepower to run anything but a web browser and some really basic applications. I've never used Linux for a longer period of time because I used to play games on my desktop and Linux plus games isn't the best combo ever. So uh, my experience is almost uh, non-existent as far as Linux is concerned. Okay, great question. That is quite a slow uh, laptop, so I would say go with Lubuntu. It's an Ubuntu variant. Um, you can get it at lubuntu.me. So L U B U N T U dot M E. Um, it's lightweight. Um, it's easy enough to, to, to use. You will have to learn how to use it, obviously. Um, but for someone who's very new to Linux, um, who's running it on a, on a really slow laptop, I would say that's the best option. Still on the quick look at Linux Mint 18.1, Martin R asks, are the security concerns still valid? I remember hearing that you should stay away from Mint if your priority is security. Okay, so these security concerns came about because Linux Mint did not update the kernel, the central component of an operating system, uh, by default. And the reason it did that is because sometimes updating the kernel can break your machine in a way that newbies would find very intimidating to try and fix. So they decided to forego kernel updates um, in favor of a more smoother, stable experience. And a lot of security boffins uh, took exception to this. Uh, now, Linux Mint gives you the option of being able to choose whether or not you update the system fully, but at a possible risk of stability or having to fix something later on down the line, uh, which is the most secure way of doing it, or it allows you to continue with the older way, or, and I think there is a third option that lets you choose every time possibly, but it gives you options this time around which do mitigate that specific uh, criticism insofar as it's secure if you choose the most secure option in the... Um, in the update manager. But yeah, whereas it might have been at one point a valid concern, nowadays if you just select the right option from the update manager, you should be fine. Superior Bean uh, talks about uh, a comment I made in Fedora 25 where I say that KDE is as heavy as, desktop, uh, as GNOME. Uh, so they say KDE is as heavy as GNOME, really? Memory usage upon desktop loading. Unity, 830 megabytes. Ubuntu GNOME, 780 megabytes. Kubuntu, 370 megabytes. Zubuntu, 370 megabytes. Uh, let's not forget that KDE has many more features than XFCE. If you install tools in XFCE to bring about the same functionality as KDE, you'll end up with a one gigabyte memory usage. The only thing KDE has worse than other desktop environments is boot up and shutdown times. But how many times are you going to restart your PC in a day? Well, um, great comment, actually. Uh, and thanks for calling me out on that. Um, I have not necessarily and extensively tried the KDE um, desktop environments for quite some time now on a, on a bare metal install. I have been on XFCE. I find XFCE to be quite uh, quite delightful as well. Um, and actually, that comment is replied to by a guy uh, called that guy is weird, uh, who says that KDE is really as only KDE is only really as heavy as you make it. That's what tends to fly over most people's heads. And I think you're right there because. Um, when you install a lot of distributions that come with KDE as their base um, desktop environment, will install a whole bunch of components on top of it, and then you'll see some kind, you know, then you'll see some uh, a desktop that uses similar resources to GNOME, and then you'll start making the the comparison that I did there. Um, but yeah, I think KDE is 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 often in a lot of cases as heavy as you make it. It's hugely, wildly customizable in so many, so many different ways, especially with things like keyboard shortcuts. Crikey, the keyboard shortcuts on KDE and Plasma are, are amazing. Um, I guess to be honest, when it when you when you start really talking about what kind of memory usage and and system resources that things like KDE uh, use, 
I, I mean, is there even a standard KDE desktop with the amount of customizability you get on it? Um, but yeah, I mean, truthfully, you can quite easily uh, get KDE down to a sensible uh, level of memory usage. Uh, a, a question I'd like to, to offer you guys is um, how... Uh, do any of you guys really know how much GPU affects a desktop environment? Do desktop environments like Cinnamon and I think KDE as well, who offer the offer like GPU acceleration, does that really take a, a load off the CPU as well? Um, it might it might be worth doing some benchmark testing on that, but I'm absolutely terrible at that um, because I know that I'll end up setting it up like, so that it ends up with a false equivalence and and, and whatnot. Um, I have I ha I've been using um, Manjaro XFCE for probably the best part of a year now, and I've been super happy with it. But starting the new year, starting 2017, I've really kind of wanted to to try something new, and I'm happy with my desktop my distribution. So I kind of want to stick with Manjaro, but I may be considering a different desktop environment. If you guys have any suggestions, uh, let me know down in the comment section below. Um, Okay, so uh, here's one. Um, Hamek Bazuksha. I apologize, I'm well aware I mispronounced that, but I'm going to run with it. Hi Chris, would you consider having a look at Arch Linux? Arch stands in a different place than most other distros because it pushes the user to actively participate in system configurations, which can be difficult to grasp for a person used to regular point-and-click approach most distros have. This kind of shift seems to, be very, seems to be very interesting, but also challenging. What do you think? Um, this is something that is on my incredibly long and not getting any shorter to-do list. Um, I've often considered perhaps doing a live stream of installing Arch, where you guys can can put in your input and 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 we could build it together, or um, or possibly just do uh, a um, like a let's play video, but a let's install, you know, let's play gameplay video type of things. But instead of uh, playing a game, we install Arch. There was that thing on Twitch, wasn't there? Twitch installs Arch, where there was an effort made that you could that um, that uh, an Arch desktop was being streamed via Twitch, and people could input commands democratically through the Twitch comment section. Um, very, very similar to Twitch plays Pokemon. It was quite amusing, but I do understand there were some uh, security problems, which kind of scuppered it, if I remember correctly. But yeah, uh, Arch takes a very different approach. Um, to a, than a lot of other distributions because it does actively demand you learn how the system works as you configure it. Uh, I have installed um, Arch a few times with success, generally speaking. I think that it's a bit more of a pain if you have to faff around with wireless. Wireless on the command line, oh, okay, not great. I've never had a, a pleasant experience with, with a wireless on the command line. Uh, everything else, yeah, yeah maybe. Um, there's no reason why I wouldn't do do that. Um, it's a matter of finding the time and um, and sitting down and, and, and doing it because that's that would be quite a uh, quite a big video. Uh, is there any way? Okay, so uh, next comment. Uh, Constantine um, asks on the video how to back up all of your uh, YouTube subscriptions. Uh, is there a way to export or save my favorites list? It's over fourteen hundred videos of songs and content. Uh, that every time I check, I'm missing over 10 to 20 videos per week because they get taken down or deleted by the user. Oh, I feel your pain. Okay, there is a way you can can deal with this. Um, it's called is a program called YouTube DL. Right now, it's available. The version in Manjaro, which I've got now, is great. Um, and if you're on Antergos, it should be great as well. Um, it should be available in most Linux distributions. I'm pretty sure it's available in Ubuntu. And what you can do is, um, if you if you go into the command line terminal um, with you, uh, YouTube-DL installed, uh, you, you can type in YouTube-DL space and then copy and paste a YouTube playlist and then press enter. Uh, the YouTube-DL application will then go down and download every video out of that um, uh, out, out of that playlist. If you're doing it with your likes or favorites, uh, you may have to adjust a setting in your privacy settings to actually make it public so that YouTube-DL can access it. I think there are other ways you can authenticate, but it, uh, that would really be the easiest way. And then you can use YouTube-DL to download your entire favorites uh, onto your hard disk and, um, and then they're safe.
So I hope I hope that helps. I would I would do a specific video for it. However, I uh, believe that YouTube uh, frown quite heavily frown quite heavily on downloading YouTube videos, uh, specifically ones that aren't yours. I think it may be against the terms and conditions. So uh, don't take that as endorsement that you should do it. But it's certainly still the easiest way. Dave Sargent leaves a comment on the video where I talk about the investigatory powers of Bill. Uh, they say more government fuckery. Here in the US, if you use a VPN, you are now assumed a threat, criminal, activist. I want to move back to the woods. I hear you. Yeah, it certainly seems the governments nowadays are more overreaching than ever. And it doesn't even seem to be partisan specific either. Uh, here in the UK, uh, in the mid 2000s, 2006, 2007, um, it was the Conservatives that I knew that were campaigning against compulsory ID cards at the time. And now it's the Conservatives that are bringing in the most surveillance heavy legislation that a Western democracy has ever seen. This seems to be a problem that has, uh, you know, that has, that has rotten the system to the core. Um, and it seems almost to be the uh, the maxim that power corrupts. That that the idea that a government now has clawed itself a measure of power through uh, through an election now has the right to take rights away from other people, uh, especially rights as as um, as personal as these as well. Um, and also the the biggest fear I have with bulk data sets and mass surveillance that I don't even think I mentioned in the video is it's one thing for a government that was voted in to perform all this mass surveillance and whatnot. But a lot of the bulk data collection goes to other uh, members of the international community. In short, it's one thing for the government that I didn't vote in, but participate in the election to have all my data. That's one thing. I don't agree with it, but it's one thing. It's a whole different thing for that moron across the pond, Donald Trump, to have access to it, who I had zero say whatsoever in in you know in, in, in his power base. And that's what I really have an issue to. Of course, it's not just Donald Trump. It, it, the same would be with Hillary Clinton or Le Pen. This is why privacy is important. It's because the person that we're handing our data over to might not be the end of where that data goes to. That's that's really the, the, the big issue here. He Pao uh, leaves a comment on the Fedora 25 video. Uh, I hate Fedora because its lifespan is too short. I like CentOS better. Uh, that is a problem with Fedora. It's short lifespan. It's short lifespan. That is the by far the biggest criticism that the, there is no LTS of Fedora. CentOS is all right, but to me, CentOS has always been a server distribution, and it's never had that polish and charm that Fedora has had. It, CentOS is fine. It's good. It's the Debian Debian of the RPM distros, um, and I certainly see why you like it better. But but it ain't. But Fedora is shiny and beautiful and elegant and it is something that I would really like to introduce to new users but it, it just requires a few extra steps to to properly set it up for home use. Um, each version of Fedora lasts for about a year before the uh, security updates come around whereas an LTS of Ubuntu is three to five. So so that's a big jump. That's a big, big jump. Um, but I agree. I agree. I, I, I think that the biggest problem with Fedora, I wouldn't necessarily say it makes me hate Fedora, but it's certainly, um, it's, uh, you know, it, if, if, you, if you're running a computer that doesn't see a good internet connection every couple of years, and there are many of these computers around, um, you know, if, if, if you're with a computer where, where your internet connection is something like, maybe it's a metered connection, maybe it's a... Um, Maybe it's a dial-up. Maybe you're stuck with... And I do. I know people who are still stuck with dial-up and, and similar kind of solutions because they live off an island off the off the coast of Wales and, and need a minimum amount of connection, maybe just for emails and, and the occasional bit of, uh, of of Twitter or whatever. But but really, uh, I don't know, I don't know if, you, if, if, if you lived on an island whether or not you'd be the kind of person to, to use Twitter on a dial-up connection. But yeah, it's... Um, I, I do feel that nowadays a... A good internet connection is a prerequisite to, to running Linux, I think, in a lot of cases. Um, especially with like Manjaro or anything Arch-based, you do need a good internet connection. Um, if you don't, then I would go with lo something long-term support, and I don't think Fedora is it, even though Fedora really, really amazing distribution, one of the best. Uh, so on the video where I looked at the Signal private messaging app, uh, Doonstorm says, uh, my only complaint is, come on, 720p? 
Um, you're right, I've been doing videos on 720p now for quite a while. Um, simply because it's that, like, you know, these are not exactly high graphical fidelity videos and, and whatnot. Um, but I suppose maybe it is time that I, I up the resolution to 1080. That can be, that's going to be my New Year's resolution, 1080p. Okay, and for the last comment, it's going to be a comment that a good number of you have made. Uh, I'm going to just focus it on um, a comment left by Nori Tech. Having access to your phone number really breaks it for me. So this was on the video where I talked about Signal Private Messenger. Uh, it is an app that um, basically replaces your SMS messaging app for a, a more private one. It's fully open source front end and back end, but it's not really designed for federalization, even though you can have a look at the source code and in theory do it. They don't necessarily support it. So basically the idea with the app is, um, is that it does. It sits on top of or it replaces your SMS messaging app and as such requires your phone number for it to, to, to be used. Um, that is certainly in many ways a deal breaker for me as well in terms of a one-size-fits-all, all-purpose uh, anonymous messaging app. But um, since so many people I know use SMS text messaging on their smartphones, it's a lot easier to bring people over to using Signal uh, Instant Messaging because it is effectively just a stand-in replacement for the SMS app. So it means that people don't have to sign up with usernames. And, you know, it's, it's always interesting how much uh, metadata can even give away. Things like usernames and, I guess, passwords, although they should be hashed properly, and other bits like bio and stuff like that. There's a lot of uh, metadata in there that, that can be unintentionally leaked. Um, so I guess that there are benefits to having the, the standard phone number as well. It minimizes the amount of metadata the app keeps on you. And that seems to be one of the avenues of, of privacy that Signal um, aims to protect is, is it just aims to take as little information from you as possible so that if it is subpoenaed, they can hand over all the information they've got on you, which is nothing. Uh, I think the only information that Signal keep on you, um, and you can find this out if you if you Google for it, uh, is, is simply that you use the, the Signal app. You know, it doesn't have who you've called, it doesn't have anything in your message, it doesn't have uh, anything in the way of metadata as far as I'm aware. It just is a, a nice encrypted SMS messaging stand-in. But it is a completely valid uh, concern that um, it, it doesn't fit every single use case because it requires the phone number. And of course, you know, I'm not going to be putting out my personal phone number on uh, on the internet as well. So, um, so it, it, it certainly isn't great in that department, but as something that just stands in for your standard SMS messenger, I think that it's it's great. It allows you to send stuff to other Signal users for free, uh, and it allows you to send to people with um, with SMS text messages as well. So uh, and it doesn't require signing up or anything like that. So yeah, it definitely does. Um, you know, I can definitely see why a, a significant number of you have had issues um, with it in regards to. Um, not not wanting it to take your SMS or your your mobile number, but um, I still think that it's worth a shot, I guess. But yeah, um, some of you have been recommending Ring, which is um, which is something that I'm going to be looking at soon. The reason I haven't looked at it so far is because I'm still waiting for it to filter through into uh, other repositories of more distributions, so that when I recommend an app. Um, well, when I recommend an app, um, one of the things I do take into account is is uh, how readily available and easy is it to, to get a hold of. Because if it's not in the repositories of, of any of the major distributions, then I'm probably not going to do a video on it because there are going to be so few people that are ever going to end up actually installing it and making use of it. And with instant messaging apps in particular, it is kind of paramount how many people end up using them. So I will certainly be, be covering Ring at some point, but... Um, I will not be doing it until it's a little bit more mainstream, I guess. Maybe that time has arrived. I'm not uh, not necessarily sure. Okay, so that's about it for me today. Thank you very much for listening to me ramble on about some of your comments. If you have any specific questions you'd like me to address in a future comment commentary, feel free to leave them in the comment section of this video. I'm hoping to do uh, a few uh, more of these as time, time goes by. I'm hoping to make them, again, a regular part of this channel. Thank you very much for listening to me witter on. That's about it for me today. And until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you've been awesome. Take care now.